Hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for visiting my sad crime channel. Today's story is another story of a Tinder date, which unfortunately doesn't have a good ending. Grace Millane was born on December 2, 1996 in Wickford, in the county of Essex, England. She was the third child of Gillian and David Millane. Grace had two older brothers. Her father was a millionaire. He owned a company called Millane Contract Services. This company offered various services related to real estate. Services such as construction, maintenance, and roofing. Grace is described as very ambitious, passionate, and eager for life. She was intelligent, always full of energy, and usually smiling. She was well liked by her peers. In 2018, Grace graduated from the University of Lincoln, where she earned a bachelor's degree in advertising and marketing. After she finished her studies, 22-year-old Grace decided to fulfill her biggest dream, namely a year-long backpacking trip across the globe. This trip was to begin in South America, and then Grace was to fly to New Zealand for two weeks. She later planned to visit Australia, Vietnam, Cambodia and Thailand. The trip was scheduled to begin in November 2018, and Grace was scheduled to return to the UK on June 26, 2019, seven weeks before her eldest brother's wedding. In November 2018, Grace began her journey. She began by joining a group tour, which toured Peru, Patagonia and Bolivia. Grace then flew to New Zealand. During her travels, the girl kept in very regular contact with her family. She contacted them through various apps and text messages. On November 20, 2018, Grace landed in New Zealand. She then toured the Upper North Island and arrived in Auckland on November 30th. On December 2nd, Grace celebrated her 22nd birthday. Throughout the day, her relatives tried to contact her to wish her well. Unfortunately, to no avail. Grace did not answer the phone or respond to messages. This was unusual behavior for her. December 5th, Grace's family reported her missing to the police. Initially, police officials claimed that there was no evidence that anything bad had happened to Grace. However, they launched a search. Very soon they received information from Grace's friend that on the 1st of December, which was the day before her birthday, the girl had met with some stranger whom she had met on Tinder. The attention of the officer in charge of the case was also caught by a comment that a man left under Grace's Facebook profile picture. This took place on the 1st of December, which is the day she is believed to have gone missing. The comment was left by a man named Jesse Kempson. On December 6, police officers invited him to the police station for questioning. He was the first person interviewed in the case. However, the man maintained that yes, on December 1st, he met with Grace. However, at 10 p.m. they said goodbye and never saw each other again. At the time, police officers still had no evidence to disbelieve him. However, they soon began receiving surveillance footage, which proved that Jesse was simply lying. On December 1st, Grace was seen in Victoria Street, in Auckland's business district. At the same time, Jesse was seen at Bluestone Bar, right next to the City Life Hotel, where he was staying. About half an hour before his scheduled meeting with Grace, Jesse drank four bottles of beer and then went to meet Grace. By the time Jesse was at the bar, Grace was already standing near Sky City, which is where they had arranged to meet. Surveillance footage shows her taking a photo with her phone of the Christmas tree which was standing there, to send it to her parents. The place they chose to meet is a very distinctive spot in the city. It is also a very public place, so it's hard to say here that Grace didn't take proper precautions. When Jesse arrived at the place, they immediately recognized each other. Because they hugged each other, smiled and headed toward the Sky City complex. Jesse and Grace went to Andy's Burgers and Bar Restaurant on the first floor of Sky Tower. They were there for about an hour and a half, under the watchful eye of surveillance. After about an hour and a half, they left and went to the restaurant, located less than a block away, Mexican Cafe. They had a few drinks and then headed to Bluestone Bar. At this bar, the couple can already be seen to have become visibly attracted to each other. The eye of surveillance cameras recorded, 
among other things, Grace kissing Jessie, and shortly thereafter sent her friend the last text message of her life. The text message said she gets along with him like with no one else. Around 9.30 p.m. Grace and Jessie entered the City Life Hotel, where Jessie was staying in room 38. The hotel's surveillance cameras recorded Grace for the last time, around 9.41 p.m. We don't know what happened behind the closed door of room 38. All we know is that Grace never came out of that room alive again. We also know that Jessie did not call anyone or ask for help when Grace lost her life. No emergency services were ever called. Whatever happened in that room, Grace never came out of it alive again. According to investigators' findings, after the death of 22-year-old Grace, Jesse looked on the internet to see where he could dispose of the corpse. He then watched some pornographic videos and took several photos of Grace's dead body, also positioning her in various poses. The next morning, he arranged to meet with another woman. In the morning, surveillance cameras captured Jesse preparing to dispose of the body. The man went to a store and bought a rather large suitcase. He then went to another store, where he bought cleaning products, and then rented a car. In the meantime, Grace lay dead in his hotel room, and he himself in the afternoon went to meet another woman, to whom he had written a few hours after Grace's murder. The woman was some kind of former journalist, and said later that Jesse had caused her distress. Jesse and the woman, whose name we unfortunately do not know, met at the Reveille Bar and shortly after the arrival of the the man started talking about how his friends were police officers. And his best friend, in a short time will come to New Zealand, to become a crown prosecutor. The woman went on to talk about how she once took part in a murder trial. To which Jesse replied, It's crazy how guys can make one wrong move and go to jail for the rest of their lives. For a woman, this was a very disturbing comment. Jesse then went on to tell the story that he had heard of a man who asked his girlfriend to have more rough intercourse. But something went wrong and during that intercourse she died. The woman said that after the date was over, she quickly went to her car and avoided roaming around the neighborhood. She was clearly afraid of the man she had just met. Despite the fact that she felt tremendous anxiety inside her, Jessie later sent her a text message asking for another date, which she promptly turned down. At around 5.45 p.m., Jesse returned to his hotel room. He returned to it along with a rented carpet washing machine. He told the rental company that he had stained his carpet with red wine. Later in the trial, photos will be shown showing the carpet sprinkled with luminol, which is a chemical used by police officers to reveal blood stains. The carpet lit up under the presence of luminol. There were plenty of blood stains on it. After Jesse cleaned the carpet, parked the car he had rented outside the hotel. He then carried the suitcase he had purchased earlier to the car. The next day, on December 3rd, at around 6.15 a.m. Jesse was filmed by surveillance cameras as he left the hotel in his rented car. During his journey to the site, as we now know, where the corpse was buried, he stopped only once to buy a shovel at a store outside the city. Later, he drove to the place where he most likely hid the corpse, and when he returned to the city, he took his clothes and bedding to the dry cleaners and cleaned his car at a car wash, cleaning it inside and out. When police officers saw all this surveillance footage, they were already sure who was behind Grace's disappearance. On December 8th, Jesse was called in for questioning again. This time, he stated that he and Grace had in fact had, on the evening of their date, intercourse in his hotel room and it was a sexual intimacy. In such a rather rough style, and then he went to bed, and Grace went to take a shower. Apparently, the girl lost consciousness in the shower. And when Jesse woke up, he saw that Grace was lying on the floor, and blood was pouring from her nose. Of course, police officers pointed out that Jesse tried to keep his story as simple as possible. First he claimed that he met Grace on a date, and simply around 10 p.m. each went their separate ways. However, during the second interrogation he already claimed that they had indeed returned to his room, however, for the sole purpose of having consensual and violent intercourse. During the interrogation, Jesse Kempson pleaded not guilty. Not only did he not admit guilt, but also blamed his victim 21 times. 
In the end, he said it was Grace, who agreed to the brutal intercourse. And she was the one who was supposed to ask him to strangle her harder and harder, which eventually ended tragically. One of the officers questioning Jesse later said that his second interrogation was completely calculating and he is basically a sociopathic narcissist. They concluded that everything he said in the first interrogation was a lie. On December 8th, Jesse Kempson was charged with Grace's murder. Around 3 p.m., he was arrested. But who exactly was he? Jesse was 26 years old and born on December 28th, 1991 in Wellington Region, New Zealand. When he was still a child, his parents separated, and he was raised by his father and grandfather. As a teenager, he briefly moved to Australia with his mother, however, in 2011 he returned to New Zealand. Jesse was very often dating women he met on the internet. He told each of them different stories about himself. He was a pathological liar. His ex-girlfriend and co-colleagues later testified to police that Jesse told them that he is the child of wealthy people and that his parents have a chain of their own restaurants and hotels in New Zealand and Australia. He also claimed that he himself held high positions in various companies and that he was even a member of a dangerous gang. All of this, of course, was untrue. All we know is that Jesse was unemployed, had no villa, which he claimed to own. He didn't even have his own car. However, it is not clear where exactly Jesse got the money from to pay for a hotel room, as well as for numerous Tinder dates. We also know that Jesse was a user of several websites and discussion forums about BDSM. Women he had previously dated also said that they had been repeatedly victims of violence on his part. It happened that while having intercourse, he would choke them so hard that they would faint. He did this without their consent. He also restrained them in various ways. Thanks to the location data of the car Jesse rented, police were able to trace the route that he traveled on December 3rd. As a result, on December 9th, around 4 p.m., they were able to reach Grace's body. It was placed in a suitcase and buried in a shallow grave off Scenic Drive in the Whitaker Ranges, about 19 kilometers west of central Auckland. An autopsy revealed that Grace died as a result of asphyxiation. For several minutes Jesse pressed her neck with his hands. Many bruises were found on her body, indicating that Grace had tried to defend herself. Dr. Simon Stable said that considerable force was needed, and the pressure on her neck must have lasted between four and five minutes. The girl had virtually no chance. Her killer was bigger and much stronger. The bruises on her body testified to the fact that Grace was tied up and strangled. She had alcohol in her blood, which, of course, was to be expected, since they had previously been to various bars and drank alcohol there. On December 11th, at the site where Grace's body was found, further investigation of the area was conducted. Police also asked the public to help find the shovel, which they believed was linked to Grace's murder. On December 13th, the shovel was found at a car wash. Kempson's trial began almost a year later, November 4th, 2019, and lasted three weeks. The jury took just five hours to reach a guilty verdict. He was convicted of Grace's murder and sentenced to life in prison with no parole for 17 years. Interestingly, Jesse's name was initially withheld because there were two different trials in his other cases. However, after he lost his appeal against his murder conviction, the order was overturned by New Zealand's Supreme Court. In 2020, it came to light that Jesse Kempson had raped another British tourist eight months before killing Grace. This tourist was 21 years old and kept it a secret until she recognized Jesse in the media when he was accused of Grace's murder. In court, she testified that Jesse raped her. When she refused to have intercourse with him, she lay on a bed, crying and frozen with fear. After this attack, for a very long time, she woke up at night crying and screaming, with nightmares and terrified that Jesse would track her down. The woman said that every time she went to bed, she saw his eyes come out of his head, staring at her angrily. In another trial, 
Jesse was accused of terrorizing his girlfriend, with whom he had lived for several months. Jesse allegedly subjected her to brutal attacks, threatened her with a knife, and forced her to engage in degrading sexual acts. He also told her that he had been sent by the CIA to kill her. Ultimately for the last two trials, Jesse Camp's son was sentenced to a total of 11 years in prison, which he was to serve concurrently with his sentence. For Grace's murder, he reportedly planned to appeal both sentences. He is currently serving his sentence in Auckland prison. And that's the end of this sad story, which can also be a lesson to other women. To be careful when making new friends. To always tell loved ones when meeting new people, where and with whom we are going. Not to get into a car with a new acquaintance. And not to see them in non-public places, to avoid telling a new person where we live. To listen to our intuition, which often guides us well. If you feel that something is wrong with the person you met with, run away. Thank you for listening to this story. Look after yourself and stay safe.